would you make welcome my wife and our pastor, executive pastor of ministry, Pastor Lisa Allen. I don't know how he does this four times every weekend. He has a lot of energy, but uh, <laughs> so he was teasing with me when he was talking to me about speaking this weekend because he was like, now you know, you remember the last two years we've had a comedian speak. And I'm like, yeah. So he was giving me a hard time telling me I needed to do a comedy routine. Well, if you guys know me, I'm not a comedian. In fact, the only reason I have a sense of humor is because I've lived with him for 28 years. <laughs> That's really helped me. But uh, in the spirit of tradition, I'm going to tell you guys a joke, okay? So I really, I don't mean to brag, but I just want y'all to know that I have finished my 14-day diet in three hours and 12 minutes. <laughs> yep, thank you. And then if you, can't, if you can't tell jokes very well, then the least you can do is just laugh at yourself. So I remembered this story from a few years ago. I was laughing at myself over it earlier this week. But um, so I was on the phone. I was leaving a voice message for somebody. I think it was my sister. I'm not sure. But on the voice message, I'm talking to her, and I'm giving her some information. And I said to her, if you don't get this voice message, check your email. The information's in the email. So, you guys, if she didn't get the voice message, she wouldn't know to check the email. So, anyway, yeah, I hung up, and I'm like, what did I just say? That was dumb. So, anyway, that's the end of my comedy routine. Y'all don't have to suffer through that anymore. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I feel so much more relaxed now than the 4 o'clock. <laughs> I don't know what it is about that 4 o'clock, that first time, just kind of, <laughs> but anyway, I feel better now, so hopefully I won't cry as much either. Last year, I, uh, I've talked to you guys before about this, that I took on a new position at church, more responsibility, and it was a lot about working out systems and processes in our church, going through our ministries that I was overseeing, and kind of reevaluating how we were doing things, and writing policies and procedures, and just a lot of that going on last year. And this year, I was, I remember early, I think it was, I think it was actually the last couple, the last week or so of January. I was driving to work one day and I just thought, I have no motivation to go to work today. And I love this place. I love working here. I love being here. And that was really a new kind of dread. And I was like, okay, Lord, what's going on? Why am I struggling with motivation? And, you know, I was just thinking, I don't want to spend another day uh, looking at another process, trying to figure out how we can do this better. And it was just, I don't know. It just kind of hit me, and what am I doing? And I feel like he told me, just, just go back to the basics, Lisa. Why do you do what you do? And so the last few months, I have just been doing that, just reminding myself of some of the basics God has taught me over the years and why I do what I do. Um, I'm going to turn in a few minutes to Ecclesiastics chapter 3, so if you want to go there, that's where I'll, I'll go here in a few minutes. But today I want to just talk about understanding my calling. And it's interesting, since this all first happened in January, how many people I've talked to in this church who've talked to me and said the same thing. I don't know what my purpose is. I, you know, I feel like God is stirring something in my heart, and I don't know what it is, and I don't know what to do. And it's just been a recurring theme in a lot of my conversations. So when we talk about, you know, what's our purpose, I think the first, first thing uh, when we talk about our calling, the first thing that we would need to remind ourselves of is our purpose. Colossians 1, 9, and 10 says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Romans 11:36 says for from him and through him and for him are all things to him be the glory forever. 
And I really believe, and I believe this for years, that the reason I exist, the reason I breathe on this earth, is to give glory to God in whatever that is, but just to, just to point to him. I believe that's all of our reasons for being here, um, just to bring him glory. And that's, that's pretty basic, but we live in such a self-centered, narcissistic world. Everything is about me. You know, that, that's the lie, really, that the enemy has put on us today, is that our purpose in this world is to satisfy ourselves. We are here for ourselves. And he, he started it back in the Garden of Eden. You remember he, uh, when he talked to Eve, he's basically telling Eve, you know, you, you, you know better for you what to do. You know, I know God said that, but, but you do what feels right. You do what's good for you. The Tower of Babel, you know, he's, he's telling people, you can be as powerful as God. You know, you don't need God. And this is, it's just this lie throughout all of humanity is that we exist for ourselves. And really, if the devil um, can get you to promote yourself, then he's really one. He's really one in your life. And we as believers, it, it's, it's in the church as well. It's in believers too, and we really just need to nail down that we are not here for ourselves. We've been bought with a price, and that, that price enables us to live an amazing life by the power of God, and we're here to bring him glory, to, to advance his kingdom. And when we realize that everything in our life should point to him, it actually eliminates a lot of uh, chaos and confusion. And I would just say, if you find yourself always, always just living a chaotic life, always, always feeling um, just distracted and confused, I would just maybe ask yourself, what is my mentality on why I'm here? Is my purpose for me? Or is my purpose to live for the Lord? Because the Lord is not a God of confusion. He's not a God of chaos. And if, if we're doing everything in our life for his glory, it just brings peace and it brings rest. It shouldn't, it shouldn't bring chaos. And parents, I would just say, um, you're really doing your kids a disservice if everything in your life is revolving around them. Because what you're teaching them is, you know, that our purpose in life isn't God. It's about them. It's okay to tell your kid no. You know, and if, if you're frustrated because your, your kids have a sense of entitlement, like you owe them something, I, I would just dare to say that they might have gotten that sense of entitlement from you in some form, uh, but you are able to drive it out of them. You know, and it's one word, no. We're really, we really do help them. We really, really do help them. If we teach them, uh, just no sometimes. Proverbs 16, verse 3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. What that word commit means is to, to roll away. To roll away your, your job, your desires, uh, your hopes, your dreams, commit it to the Lord, roll it away to him, and he will establish your plans. And basically what that's saying is he will, um, my iPad just died, he will determine your purpose. He'll show you his, your purpose, his purpose for your life if you just give it all away to him. I'm going to try to get my notes back, or y'all will get a very unusual message tonight. <laughs> Commit your works to the Lord, <laughs> and your plans will be established. I wonder if he's trying to tell me something. So if we understand that our purpose is to bring him glory, um, then the next question we need to ask as believers is, uh, what gift has he given to me individually uh, to bring him glory? We need to understand our gifts. Uh, the... 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. In the last few years, God has really been teaching me a lot about who he created me to be and really to um, 
kind of own that and and uh, activate it as much as he gives me the you know the power and the strength to do it and I think it's interesting that one of Satan's lies to us is that in the gifts God has given to us he tells us well it's not good enough you know you're not smart enough you're not talented enough when when we talk about our purpose in life he, he lies and he says it's all about you and then when we talked about our gifts in life, he says, well, you're really not good enough. I think it's really interesting. He's such a deceiver and such a manipulator and distorts everything uh, godly that, that God has for us. And um, so I needed some help. I just needed some help understanding my giftings over the last few years. I'd had people tell me, Lisa, you're gifted in this, or, or we feel like you have this spiritual gift, but nothing seemed to really fit fit right. Nothing, I was like, yeah, I, mean, I could see that a little bit, but, but I don't really know. And we've just been blessed as a staff uh, just to have some teachings and go, to go to some conferences where they really talked about strengths. Um, we've taken personality tests, and I would encourage you, if y'all have never done that, to, to do it. There's a test out there called Strength Finders. It, is, it, is, it was so eye-opening to me, and it really helped me identify uh, what God has put into my DNA. Um, but we took tests, we took personality tests, and then last year, in May, June, and July, Mark did the Gifted series. And for those of you who were here, that was a phenomenal series. I would encourage you to go back and, and listen to those messages because it was very, very eye-opening. Sometimes we just need help with people telling us, hey, this is what God's put in you. This is what I see in you. And that's what, the, what God has been blessing me with over the last few years is just, just opening my eyes, giving me some more wisdom in that, in that area. So one of my gifts that I have uh, defined over the last few years is that of a steward. And I looked it up in the di dictionary this week, and stewardship is the acceptance or assignment of responsibility to shepherd and safeguard the valuables of others. It is the responsible overseeing and protection of something considered worth caring for and preserving. So this year I literally did this because I'm thinking, okay, Lord, I'm just working on these processes and these systems, and, you know, I'm just having a hard time, you know, seeing how this is, you know, bringing you glory. So I wrote this down, and this has really helped in my personal motivation. I wrote, my gifting is to steward things for the purpose of bringing God glory, making him famous, and advancing his kingdom here on earth. And that's what I remind myself of. My gifting is to steward things for the purpose of bringing God glory, making him famous, and advancing his kingdom here on earth. So when I'm, when I'm working on how we do life groups and I'm thinking, how can we do this better? How can we do this more efficiently? I'm doing it because I know that if we do a better job of, of that, we reach more people. More people come to know Christ. More people mature in their walk with Christ. So the thing I'm stewarding, even though it's kind of you know, behind the scenes and it just seems methodical sometimes, it's for the purpose of bringing God glory and making him famous and advancing his kingdom here on earth. So say your gift is encouragement. I looked up the definition of an encourager this week, and this is what an encourager is, just in some, some random dictionary. It says, and if I can find it, I can't even find it. But encourage, I can remember, means to put courage in, to bring hope to. So if you're an encourager, then you in, your motivation is I encourage people for the purpose of bringing God glory, making him famous, and advancing his kingdom here on earth. If you're a teacher, you put that in. My gifting is to teach for the purpose of bringing God glory, making him famous, and advancing his kingdom here on earth. So my purpose to bring him glory and advance his kingdom has never changed. And his specific design, one of the specific things he's put in my life, which is stewardship, has never changed. I can look back to when I was a kid and, and see that you know, through, throughout uh, my whole life. But how he chooses to use me as a steward, that has definitely changed. An overwhelming theme in scripture uh, 
regarding life revolves around agriculture. Scripture talks about sowing and reaping. Mark's been talking a lot about that in his messages. It talks about seasons. So once we understand our purpose, which is bring God glory and advance his kingdom, and once we understand the gifts that he's put in us, the third thing we need to understand is our season and how we are to use those gifts in the season God has us in. I, um, I was a nurse for over 20 years, and I, most all of those years I worked in critical care. And I can see myself as a steward in nursing. Remember, stewardship is the assignment of a responsibility to shepherd and safeguard the valuables of other. Well, a human being is a pretty is valuable, you know, to others. Um, it's the responsible overseeing and protection of something considered worth caring for and preserving. Well, I, I did that as a nurse. When I, when I would go in to my shift, I would think of, you know, that day I'm like, okay, this patient is on this drip for their, medica for their blood pressure. So I've got 12 hours to work on this. And in 12 hours from now, I'm going to make their blood pressure better. I'm going to just do whatever I can so I can wean them off that medication. So I would go in daily and just think, how can I make this situation better for this patient? Well, if you're an encourager and you're a nurse, you might approach every shift with, how can I go in and inspire this patient and encourage this patient that there's hope for tomorrow, that they're going to be better tomorrow? You know, how can I bring them joy today? You know, as an encourager, you're, you, you do the same job, but your whole outlook is different. And um, so if I, the one thing I, I, as I have understood more about stewardship, I look back and I, you know, I got married, I had kids. Well, I stewarded my family in that season. Um, you know, 10, 11 years ago, I became the worship pastor and I was, I stewarded the gifts and the talents of those on the worship team. Last year, the executive ministry pastor, you know, for years, I've been a pastor's wife. I don't, I don't know. Mark came and became a pastor when we were like 22, very young. But if my identity, if my purpose in life is as a nurse, then I'm in trouble because I don't practice nursing anymore. And if my identity and my purpose in life is as a worship pastor or an executive ministry pastor, I'm in trouble because one day I will not be those things. One day, someone else will have those titles and those roles and those responsibilities. But if I'm confident in what my purpose is, which is to bring God glory and advance his kingdom, and if I understand the gifts that he's put in me, then no matter what the season is, I know that God is just putting me in a new season to work out that same gift to bring him glory. And it's not tied to this title or this job or this position so it's really it's vital it's vital that we understand why we're here and that it's not wrapped up in in our job because it, it's not because god can use us from the time we're a small child to the time to the day we die he can use us but that that will always look different you know depending on what season we're in so once we understand uh, once we start looking at the season, um, we see it's really a very biblical way uh, to approach life. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I'm just going to start reading in verse 1. It's a real familiar passage that says there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. It's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. You know, part of growing in Christ is really understanding um, the, the season in our life and really understanding the message of Ecclesiastes. 
And that message is that God is in control of whatever season you're in. You know, we'd like to, we'd like Ecclesiastics to read this. A time to be born, a time to plant, a time to heal, a time to build, a time to laugh, a time to dance. You know, we want to skip all those other parts. But if we really believe what Ecclesiastes is saying, uh, then we believe that in every single opportunity, no matter what you are facing today, there's an opportunity for growth. And no matter what you're facing today, God is in control of it. That last part says everything is beautiful in its time. Understanding that life is seasons, it really does ground us, and it, it gives us an anchor. Uh, it, it reminds us that seasons are coming. There's no use in wasting time and energy worrying about it uh, and just fretting over the change that we see um, because God's in control of it. And every season has a purpose. In, in nature, there are four seasons. And you guys know them all. Fall. Fall is really a time of transition. You know, the animals are preparing for the, the winter. The leaves are falling off the tree. It's a time of harvest. Time of gathering the abundance of summer. And then there's winter. You know, there's a death in winter. There's brokenness. Nature can definitely be our enemy in winter. Um, but, but winter really can bring a gift, too. You know, when the trees are stripped bare and the skies are clear, uh, it can be a time of real clarity as well. And then spring, love spring, it's fruitfulness, and green starts to emerge, and flowers are coming up everywhere, and new growth is happening. And summer is just abundance and, and plenty and uh, rest and joy, you know, you just fun, a lot of fun in summer. And we'd, we think we always want to stay in spring, you know, or summer. We want those, those times of revival. We want the, uh, the glory of summer and spring uh, without having to deal with some of the harder times of autumn and winter. But in our, in our personal lives and in our spiritual lives, if we try to skip a season, then what we're going to get is artificial. We're just going to produce artificial fruit. Because we need every single season. Seeds need time to mature. Seeds need the fall and the winter so that you can have the abundance of spring. And spiritually, it really, it really is true, even though we don't really like it. But true spiritual growth really cannot happen without seasons in our life. And if you want fruit that really remains and fruit that uh, stands the test of eternity, you're going to have to walk through a, a maturing process. As I have been uh, thinking about seasons and this church, I just, I love what God is doing here, and I love what he's done over the last 12 years, and I, when we moved here, I, I thought, what in the world are we moving to Athens for? I thought, and, and I, I really thought this. I thought we're limiting. We're limiting what, what God can do in our lives because we're going to this little town and, I mean, how, how much can God do? And I'm just, I'm so ashamed of that and I'm so thankful that God's blessing didn't uh, depend on my vision. Years ago in North Carolina, 1997, 98, I had a, I, I think I've only had one vision in my life. And I, I remember sitting in a service and I had a vision of a black stage, black, dark walls, black platform. And it was, there weren't people on it, but in my vision, I saw potential. That's what it was telling me, was potential. That one day on this platform, there's going to be worship. There's going to be uh, just a, a move of God. And I saw that back in 1990-something. And I thought it was for that time. I thought it was for that season. And it never came to fruition in what my thinking was. And then... Um, 
back in 2011, we were building this building and they put together this platform. And, you know, in 2011, we were still a couple hundred people. And I thought, that's the platform I saw. And it was just like God was just reminding me of his goodness in the season. You know, I don't know why he gave that to me back all those years. And then, then he started to, you know, to do things here. But and I, that, I totally got off on sharing that story. But I just thought, you know, God is just faithful no matter what season we're in. He sees the big picture. You know, and when we, we might be, and I know because we all, we all walk through them. Some of you guys are, uh, you're in fall right now. You're in a time of transition. You know, this is the season of graduation, and graduation is great for those graduating. It's a tough time for parents. Some of you are in winter, and things are just bleak, and you're struggling, and you may be grieving right now. You may be just, you may be depressed, and you're really just in a, in a winter season. Maybe, maybe you're in spring or summer, and there's just abundance, and God's doing new things and showing new things. And I just want to encourage you, whatever season you're in, uh, don't rush it. Just let God do his work, and that's especially hard in, in winter, you know, because we just want it to be over. But what I have learned is that uh, there's really no quick fixes with God. And God uses one season to prepare us for the next season. We work it out just day by day. I love the Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. And just from a church standpoint, um, you know, nobody's in revival all the time. No one's in spring all the time. Churches aren't in, in revival all the time. Um, we have learned a lot as a church from other churches. We have grown so much from the teaching of other churches, but we can't live in their season. We have to live in the season that God has us, and we, we have to follow him where he wants us to go. I, I believe, I believe, I believe, and the Lord just reminded me about it again this week, that the local church, I, I just believe, is the hope of the world. Because we are stewarding the message of Jesus Christ. We are stewarding the only message that brings hope to this world. I was in an AA meeting this week with a friend. And AA has some great principles. But it is not stewarding the message of Jesus Christ. We are. And we've got we've to step up to the plate as the church to to spread that news, to spread that joy uh, to this world. They're desperately in need of it. And if, you've, if you're planted here at life, then God has a reason for you here at life. I, I heard a statistic a couple of weeks ago that 4,000 new churches are being planted every year. That sounds great, doesn't it? 4,000. Well, 7,000 churches are closing every year. Those are bad, bad odds. But Life Fellowship is a life-giving, spirit-empowered church. God is, doing, God is doing amazing things here, and he's called you here. If you call this your home, you are here to be involved in a move of God and a work of God. And I think we're just getting started. I think we, <laughs> I believe we are just getting started. And as that building goes up across the way here... It's a reminder to me of a stirring that God is doing, not just in me, not just in the staff, but a stirring he's doing in you. Because that means we've all got to step up to another level. We've got to ask, God, what is it you're, you're doing here? And how can I be part of it? And how can I be involved? And what gift have you put in me to advance the kingdom of God and to bring him glory. There's no greater calling in life. I 
I just want to close with um, this, this idea of seasons have been so much on my heart. And I'm, I've asked the Lord just to make me more sensitive to the seasons that other people are going through because we're all walking through different seasons. And um, as, as parents, we need to understand that our kids walk through different seasons. And we really need to help them to discern the season they're in. And the, the best thing we can do for our kids is to remind them that even though seasons change, God is permanent, God is stable, God is faithful. And if you are, if your home is a house of drama, if you fall apart at every piece of unusual or difficult news, all you're doing is teaching your children that you can't rely on God. And we have got to, as parents, set the example that, that he's in charge of the season. We have, I've been in the schools lately because uh, we've been feeding them lunch. You guys have been feeding the teachers lunch in this, in this county. And these kids are in trouble. They're desperate for, for someone to, to give them the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's, that's us. You know, I just feel a, a burden that whatever our call is, whatever our purpose, whatever our gift is, We've got to decide that this life is not about us, but it's about advancing his kingdom wherever, wherever we are. And we have to be sensitive to the seasons of others. You know, um, as leaders, if you lead a business, your employees are going through different seasons. And you can't, you can't lead your employees all from your perspective, your season. You know, some of your employees are going through a divorce or a broken relationship or an illness. And you need to, to recognize that they're walking through something in their life and you need to lead them differently than if they're walking in a season of spring or summer. You need to lead your kids differently. You know, one kid may be in a season of winter and another kid might be in a season of spring and you need to lead them differently, understand they have different needs. The people sitting around you are all in different seasons. Don't, don't walk around wearing your feelings on your, on your sleeve because someone didn't, uh, you know, acknowledge you like they should. You don't know what season they're walking in. Spouses, we've got to give each other grace in the seasons because we don't always walk in the same season together. Friends, you've got to give your friends grace as they're walking through the season. I have a friend walking through a really tough season. I don't understand it. I have, I have no comprehension of how they can be in the season they're in. It doesn't make sense to me. But my responsibility is not to, to understand. My responsibility is just to love them and give them grace. We are a family. This family, I am so in love with this family. And I want us to, I want to see us be all that God has called us to be. And to, and to do that, we've, we've got to know that we know that we know that we're here for for him we're here to bring him glory and he's he's put very special gifts into each one of you and satan is a liar if he tells you you're not good enough or you're not smart enough or you're not talented enough to do something that has an impact in the world he is a liar because we are an army we are the army of god and if we come alongside each other and we spur each other on to good deeds and we teach each other and we help each other and we encourage each other, there's nothing that God won't do through us.